My name is James McKillop. I'm the director of the Michael G. DeGroot Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our 2023 conference, Innovations in the Science of Cannabis. Uh, this is a very exciting time for us. It will be our first in-person meeting. These are the uh, four CME accredited fundamentals foundations sessions today. Uh, and then we will be starting our live conference tomorrow morning. And uh, I want to start simply by saying um, welcome and how glad we are that you are choosing to join us. Uh, how excited we are for a very, very rich program and an opportunity to take stock of the impacts of uh, recreational cannabis legalization in Canada five years on. Um, we have a really uh, remarkable group of speakers who are joining us. Um, we have uh, seven keynotes uh, from across Canada and internationally. We have uh, opening remarks from Senator Stan Kutcher, one of the leading voices on evidence-based policy in Canada, especially around mental health. We have a variety of uh, local McMaster faculty and research collaborators and trainees who will be presenting their work. And of course, we have these sessions today that provide a um, foundation for understanding uh, the science of cannabis. So I think it's gonna be a, a really wonderful meeting. Um, there are a number of acknowledgements I wanna make. I, I wanna start always by acknowledging and recognizing that uh, McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, I also want to acknowledge more proximally uh, Alan Fine, uh, our research coordinator and the uh, heavy lifter extraordinaire behind this conference each year, and Mike Ayers, our uh, communications lead, both of whom have um, put a great deal of time and effort into uh, organizing this meeting and uh, will also be uh, tremendous resources if you have questions or concerns over the course of the meeting. Um, I also want to acknowledge the DeGroote Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research Medical Advisory Board, which is co-chaired by Drs. Jen Brash and Ramesh Zakarias, um, and comprises also myself, uh, Dr. Jason Bussa, and Dr. Lee Naji. This is the group that provides input on the medical relevance of our research program, but also critically provides uh, support for the accreditation of our CME foundation sessions, this being the first, and uh, has been instrumental in supporting this conference. Before I get started, I do also want to make sure that I'm forthright about my disclosures. I do receive unrestricted research funding from a variety of sources, including philanthropic sources and federal funders, uh, I am a principal in a technology transfer startup and have served as a consultant to a pharmaceutical company. Uh, but it's important that I emphasize that I have no consulting relationships to any cannabis uh, entities. I don't have any stocks or investments or other financial relationships with any commercial cannabis entities. And more broadly, the central operating support for the DeGroote Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research comes from a philanthropic gift to McMaster University and specifically the DeGroote Initiative for Innovation in Healthcare. It's really important to us that we maintain uh, complete objectivity in the research that we do. In some cases, uh, some faculty members do collaborate with industry partners to support doing high quality research. But as a research center, we really uh, prize the fact that we are fully independent of the cannabis industry. And our tagline has always been, we're not pro-cannabis, we're not anti-cannabis, we're pro-evidence. And we believe that the uh, best way to, to do the best research we can is to have central objectivity. And just one last comment before we get started with this first session, the, the guiding uh, vision for our research program is balance. Again, not pro-cannabis, not anti-cannabis. We're interested in really 
weighing out the potential benefits of cannabis in therapeutic contexts and the potential harms of cannabis in general and in the context of medical cannabis, and really taking an evidence-based perspective of cannabis in all of its different forms. Um, so that yin and yang will be a theme throughout our conference. And uh, this first session is intended to provide a, uh, a, a kind of platform for uh, making those kinds of judgments yourself based on the evidence you'll learn about. So today, what I'm going to focus on uh, is really four different domains. And uh, the first is going to be fundamentally, what are cannabinoids? What are we talking about? There are many different products. There is an alphabet soup of uh, acronyms. And it's important to understand what we are meaning when we talk about different products and uh, their associated pharmacology. I'm going to follow up with uh, a brief description of the history of cannabis in terms of uh, its medical applications uh, and take both the long view and the short view there, focusing particularly on uh, the recent history in Canada. Um, we're going to talk about the epidemiology of cannabis use uh, from the 10,000 foot perspective. So uh, we're not talking about cannabis use disorder in this session. The focus is going to be primarily on what do we know about who is using across the lifespan in terms of total prevalence, and the emphasis here is really going to be on a lot of the data that existed prior to legalization, because in the sessions that follow tomorrow and on Thursday, the focus will be on really how things have changed over the past five years. And then the last part of the presentation will be a very brief introduction to what are we talking about when we're talking about evidence-based medicine and how do we apply frameworks that can help us best judiciously sift between the evidence of benefit and the evidence of harm as we make judgments, recommendations, and guidelines around medical cannabis. So let's get started with cannabis fundamentals. So when we talk about cannabis fundamentals, really, I think what we want to emphasize is the big categories. So there are four uh, or five big categories of cannabinoids. And we'll start with the endocannabinoids or endogenous cannabinoids, which are naturally occurring uh, uh, molecules in the body and brain that are a lipid signaling system. We're also gonna talk about plant products, uh, medicinal plant cannabis and recreational plant cannabis. And we're going to talk about pharmaceutical cannabinoids, that is, the medicines that are traditional medicines that are to a certain extent inspired by uh, plant-based medicines. And then the last thing we're gonna talk about are synthetic cannabinoids. So these are four uh, big classes. And I say four because one distinction that I wanna get rid of right away is uh, between the plant products, often uh, people talk about medical cannabis products and recreational cannabis products as being separate. But the reality is, they are very different in uh, terms of composition, but fundamentally they're all plant cannabis products. And depending on who you're talking to, they may be the same for recreational or medical purposes, or they may be very different. So fundamentally we're talking about four different classes of products, endocannabinoids, plant cannabis products, pharmaceutical cannabinoids, and synthetic cannabinoids. Let's get started with the endocannabinoids. So when we're talking about the endocannabinoid system, what we're talking about is a uh, messenger system in the body and brain that primarily entails two different molecules, arachidonyl ethylenamide and uh, two arachidonyl glycerol. The former is typically referred to as anandamide, uh, and the second is referred to as 2-AG. As you can see, these are uh, quite similar to each other, although with important differences also at a molecular level. And what these different neurotransmitters uh, do is bind to different uh, uh, cannabinoid receptors. And there are two cannabinoid receptors, CB1 cannabinoid receptor 1 and CB2 cannabinoid receptor 2. In, uh, we, we know much more about CB1 receptors in terms of their localization and their functionality. In terms of where they're located uh, in this PET scan, you can see a heat map of CB1 receptor localization. And this basically shows you where the 
highest density of CB1 receptors are in the brain. You can see that they're in frontal lobes, occipital cortex, um, some of the uh, subcortical regions, including uh, hippocampus and amygdala, areas like the uh, insular cortex. And um, then importantly, these receptors are also uh, located outside of the central nervous system too. They're in the peripheral nervous system, but they're also in several organ systems, including the liver, the spleen, they're in fat tissue, and they're in the, the GI tract. So uh, cannabinoid signaling, and uh, what I mean by cannabinoid here means anything that's binding with the CB1 or CB2 receptor. Cannabinoid signaling happens throughout the body. There are uh, vast numbers of these receptors, and they are principally stimulated by these two uh, naturally occurring uh, compounds, anandamide and 2-AG. In terms of their role in the body and brain, this is a, a nice visualization that shows uh, the differential distribution of CB1 and CB2, CB1 in green, CB2 in uh, blue. You can see the uh, heavy density of CB2 in liver and spleen, um, but uh, the, the representation of both uh, receptor subtypes throughout the, the body and brain. Within the brain, uh, the, the heaviest density, as I showed before in the PET scan, are in regions of the cerebral cortex that are related to uh, higher order executive function, uh, aspects of decision making, abstraction, uh, uh, working memory, and then other areas uh, that are also critical for uh, cognition, like the hippocampus, uh, which is essential for learning and memory, um, the amygdala, which is essential for emotional valence and learning, and then other uh, regions that are responsible for aspects of uh, thermoregulation, for example, like the hypothalamus, or for more basic motor control, like the, the cerebellum. Another important uh, area that's of interest is that there's a high density of uh, CB1 receptors in the dorsal vagal complex, and that's partially related to uh, the, the effect of uh, uh, cannabis and cannabinoids on uh, nausea, since that's the biological basis for a lot of the uh, emetic reflexes. Okay, so. That's the existing innate endocannabinoid system, a, uh, a signaling system like other neurotransmitter systems in some ways, although different in other ways. Um, and we're going to move now to plant cannabis products. And uh, when we're talking about plant cannabis products, we're really talking about um, the species, uh, the genus uh, cannabis and the species sativa, indica, and ruderalis. These are the three kinds of cannabis plants. Sativa is associated with the long finger-like leaves. Indica is associated with the wider, thicker, shorter uh, leaves. Ruderalis, we rarely talk about. It's a uh, shorter uh, uh, plant that uh, has very low levels of both THC and CBD and is largely only cultivated for agricultural purposes. Um, the, the lore is that uh, cannabis sativa is associated with more stimulant effects whereas indica is associated with more sedative effects, indica into bed, so to speak, according to bud tenders. The reality is there's very little uh, data that suggests a categorical difference in psychoactive effects based on sativa and indica plants. Um, this is a quote I like that uh, describes that distinction as, a, as total nonsense and an exercise in futility. The reality is there are very widely varying effects of cannabis, but that has much more to do with the composition of any given plant in terms of the levels of uh, THC and other surrounding uh, cannabinoids, not necessarily the global characteristics of sativa versus indica. The other reality is when people actually analyze the uh, uh, genomic basis for a lot of the plant products that are on the market, they find that these are highly hybridized strains. They are not actually sativa, indica, or hybrid as they're being marketed. So really those distinctions are more marketing than science. 
Cannabis is a very complex drug because of its uh, very varying uh, composition and routes of administration that lead to many different acute and chronic effects. And so what I'll introduce is a kind of framework for thinking about this complexity, thinking about the drug's pharmacodynamics and its pharmacokinetics. What I mean by pharmacodynamics is the actions of the drug in the brain and peripheral nervous system. And what I mean by pharmacokinetics is the drugs processing the ADVE, so to speak, of the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of cannabis. And these are fundamentally within human psychopharmacology, the two principal factors that determine a drug's acute and chronic effects, whether they're good or bad, what the drug does in the body and brain, and how the drug passes through the body uh, and its uh, associated differences in effect. So just to use cocaine as an example uh, for how we understand this, here is an example of the cocaine molecule, cocaine hydrochloride. This is typically consumed either via inhalation, intranasal consumption, or intravenous consumption. And that's what's responsible for the acute and chronic effects of cocaine. Uh, likewise, here's an example of nicotine. Nicotine is schematized here as far as its uh, molecular structure. It can be inhaled, but it can also be consumed orally, uh, uh, intranasally, or transdermally in the form of nicotine replacement treatment. And these different pharmacokinetic properties are the big distinguisher between the uh, addictive potential of inhaled combustible tobacco versus the therapeutic potential of oral intranasal or transdermal nicotine. And so, as you can see, just in looking at the differences in pharmacokinetics, the role of a drug can be very different from an addictive drug to a therapeutic drug. When it comes to cannabis, this is complicated because the cannabis plant is a veritable trove of different compounds that impinge on or activate uh, or otherwise affect the endocannabinoid system. So. Uh, we know that there are more than 100 cannabinoids. The one that we probably know the most about is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. Um, it can also be uh, consumed in a variety of different ways. It can be inhaled. It can be consumed orally or transdermally. Um, there are many different routes of administration, and this leads to quite different acute and chronic effects. So besides THC, we also, of course, have cannabidiol, CBD, we have cannabichromine, cannabigerol, cannabinol, and the list goes on and on. So in addition to THC and CBD and the other uh, cannabinoids that you're most familiar with, there are also all the different terpenes and other plant products that are known to be, in many cases, cannabinoids too, affecting that endocannabinoid system. These compounds like uh, alpha-pinene or uh, eucalyptol are volatile oils that give cannabis its very evocative smell when it's uh, combusted and are responsible for a lot of the variation across uh, cannabis products in terms of smell and it, to a certain extent in terms of its psychoactive effects. At this point, it's been well established that there are more than 500 constituents within the cannabis plants and more than 100 of these impinge on the endocannabinoid system this number only keeps getting higher. I would encourage you to check out the Cannabis Database, a project that was uh, funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research that allows you to search for different cannabis compounds. They are documenting hundreds and hundreds of different compounds within the cannabis plant that may have therapeutic purposes, that may add to its abuse liability or other harms. And what we know is that this is an incredibly prolific plant in terms of its uh, bioactive constituents. So here's where things get complicated. We have a plant where there are hundreds of cannabinoids that can be consumed using a variety of different routes of administration. And as a result, they have different uh, properties in terms of absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, and elimination. And that can lead to quite different effects. It's not a single singular drug, it, it really can be a wide variety of different drugs when you think about the different constituents in their routes of administration. A further complicating factor is that it's believed that some of the different compounds within cannabis may interact together and have what's referred to as an entourage effect, meaning that when a variety of different cannabinoids are consumed, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. They may collectively stimulate the endocannabinoid system in beneficial ways that can't be 
easily distilled by studying only a single one or other ones. There are other complications uh, in terms of understanding plant-based ca uh, cannabinoids or, or cannabis products nowadays because the, the goalposts are moving, so to speak. There is a, a gradual increase in the levels of THC. This is just one study showing from 1995 to 2014. The rates of the levels of THC in confiscated cannabis products went up basically threefold from around 4% to around 12%. And this is not a, a one-off. These are data from a meta-analysis and systematic review of changes in THC over time going all the way back to 1970 up through 2017, these different colored lines show the different um, patterns of change over time. What you can see is that there's a, a very common theme of increasing levels of THC in dried flower cannabis. Basically, the uh, meta-analysis found that for each year, there was about a third of a percent increase in THC uh, over time. And this was based on over 65,000 samples in eight different studies. So in general, cannabis has been getting stronger and stronger over time. Cannabis products we think about from a couple of decades ago are simply qualitatively different from the ones that are widely used today. There are also ultra high strength products nowadays, gelato, butter, wax, shatter, crumble. These are extracts or products that are created by dissolving the cannabis plant in solvents and then like uh, distilling uh, uh, whiskey in the case of alcohol, essentially distilling cannabis into these um, very high potency products. Some of these products or aptly named concentrates can have levels of THC up to 90%. And so these are uh, categorically different um, products compared to the three and 4% dried flower cannabis of yesteryear. We also have a much wider array of edibles and drinkables now, cannabis cookies, cannabis cakes, cannabis candies, cannabis gummies, cannabis beverages in all variety of different sources. Um, and there are other uh, routes of administration also. What we learned from a, a patient advocacy group was that the highest priority was increasing access to cannabis suppositories, which apparently are a uh, increasing um, part of the uh, marketplace. So when it comes to plant cannabis, it's a very wild and woolly array of products we're talking about. We're talking about conventional plants of varying uh, composition. We're talking about uh, edibles, drinkables, concentrates, all are coming from a plant product, but they are fundamentally very different. Um, moving now to the pharmaceutical cannabinoids. Now what we're talking about are the traditional medicines that were largely inspired by plant products. So what we're talking about here are uh, certain products that are uh, uh, either FDA or Health Canada approved for specific indications. Um, I'm gonna uh, focus on what the, the indications are. These are either products that are synthetic forms of THC in the case of nabilone and dronabinol. They are essentially trying to identify the uh, or extract the beneficial compound in the form of THC from cannabis. They're typically taken orally, um, either as tablets or capsules, although there is a formulation of dronabinol that is a, an oral um, liquid solution. And they have been approved for as anti-nausea or anti-emetic uh, agents. In some cases, they've been approved for chronic pain. They've been approved for, in other cases, uh, appetite stimulation. But we have two products, Navalone and Dronavanol, that are synthetic THC and do have some. They have drug identification numbers. They are like conventional medications. They require a physician's prescription. Um, there are other products that do not, uh, that, are, that are qualitatively different, like Nabixamols, which tries to create that entourage effect, but do, do, but do does so within a conventional medical product. This is a combination of THC and CBD. It's an oromucosal spray. And this has been approved uh, for neuropathic pain and for treating spasticity in multiple sclerosis. So that's a THC plus CBD product. And then most recently, uh, cannabidiol, a purified form of cannabidiol 
uh, has been approved by the FDA and Health Canada for treating uh, refractory pediatric seizure disorders. And this is uh, typically, uh, uh, th this is approved as an oral solution. So there are medical products that ha have been developed to mimic the plant products um, and have specific existing indications. And to provide kind of a, a metaphor, in some ways, this is a, a good example of how, uh, or a parallel of how ancient or medieval medicine has given rise to aspects of modern medicine. So um, willow bark has for decades, if not millennia, been used to treat fever and inflammation and pain, the bark of the willow tree. And that's uh, in part because the bark of the willow tree contains a, a compound called psilocin. And psilocin, when consumed, is metabolized into a, a, a downstream product called salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is very similar to acetyl salicylic acid, which is the uh, technical name for aspirin. So what we see is that in the, the development of the modern aspirin that we take for fever or for uh, pain, uh, there is a, a, a historical precursor and in some ways, the pharmaceutical cannabinoids are trying to do something similar. They're trying to identify what is helpful about the plant product, the cannabis plant, and then distill that and formulate it in a highly reliable, uh, controlled uh, format in order to, to maximize its uh, medical benefit. So this is really, in some ways, the pharmaceutical cannabinoids can be understood as a uh, an attempt to harness the uh, the benefits of uh, ancient plant medicine in the context of, of modern medicine. So why is it that most people who use cannabis for medical purposes are using non-pharmaceutical products? Why do people use the licensed producer network and the uh, uh, authorization system rather than getting uh, medically prescribed uh, pharmaceutical cannabis that, that's a, a, an interesting and open question. There's several possibilities. Some is that there may be pharmacological differences. We're talking about at least in terms of Marinol and Dronavinol. These are synthetic THC. They're not quite the same as THC. There are quite different routes of administration. Um, they're typically oral products as opposed to inhaled products. So it may be that inhaled products give people more control over their dosing. They may have rap more rapid onset and offset. And as a result, have uh, more desirable pharmacokinetics. Um, the other possibility is that the plant products have these entourage effects, and as a result, they're preferred by consumers um, because they are more efficacious, quite simply because they have not only THC or CBD or both, but they have lots of other uh, biochemical um, constituents also. And then the last possibility is that some of this may be placebo effects, that people believe that they will experience more benefit from a plant-based medicine or a plant-based product. And as a result, those are the products that they would prefer. Um, and uh, the plant-based products certainly do have a, a variety of properties that are very favorable to developing placebo effects or expectancies in terms of the the, the rituals of consumption, the products associated, the evocative smell and taste, um, as opposed to taking a, a traditional uh, pill. All of these are open questions, but the reality is many more people uh, take uh, authorized medical plant products for medical purposes rather than uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, medicines for uh, medical cannabis purposes. The last category of cannabis products we're going to talk about are the synthetic cannabinoids. And these are uh, even further away from the plant than the pharmaceutical cannabinoids. What we're talking about here are products like Spice or K2, which are uh, sold uh, as um, uh, uh, for aromatherapy punitively, but are uh, uh, consumed by inhalation and these are basically plant products that have been impregnated with synthetic molecules that have been identified as acting on the endocannabinoid system. A scientist in the US named uh, J.W. Huffman was funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse to identify novel endocannabinoid ligands. And in doing so, he identified novel compounds that do impinge on the endocannabinoid system and do so very powerfully 
Um, but those have now been appropriated and are used for illicit purposes for these uh, synthetic cannabinoids. They are chemically unlike any of the endo endogenous cannabinoids. They're unlike the compounds that are found in plant cannabis or pharmaceutical cannabinoids. And they're basically sprayed on plant material to, to resemble cannabis and sold as a kind of in a gray area as um, aromatherapy options that are that can be uh, then consumed for inhalation. When that happens, unfortunately, people have often very negative reactions. They have very strong psychoactive effects. They can substantially disrupt uh, uh, thermoregulation, heart rate, respiration. They can induce uh, delusions and, uh, I'm sorry, delirium and psychosis. There have been intermittent outbreaks of these uh, of, of uh, problems resulting from um, synthetic cannabinoids. This is one story from CNN from a situation in New York when uh, uh, about two dozen people all had to be hospitalized because of adverse consequences from synthetic cannabinoids. But fundamentally, we're fortunate that that doesn't happen all that commonly in, in Canada, but nonetheless, these are part of the, uh, the landscape. So these are the, the, the four major categories. Our internal body's natural biology, the endocannabinoids, the plants and their constituents that act on that system, the pharmaceuticals that have been developed to mimic the plants to harness the potential benefits. And then finally, these sort of mutant compounds that have been created in order to uh, identify ligands for the endocannabinoid system, but have been appropriated for uh, illicit purposes and can have very adverse effects for consumers. So let's talk about the, the history of cannabis use. That, that, that hopefully has disambiguated some of the terms around categories and the, the alphabet soup of acronyms. Um, when it comes to, to the history of cannabis, um, in many ways, the history of cannabis recapitulates the history of humanity. Um, we know from paleobotany that as far as 9,000 years, I'm sorry, nearly 12,000 years ago, uh, there is evidence of cultivation of cannabis plants, probably not initially for their psychoactive purposes, although we can't know for sure. Certainly, uh, cannabis as a plant is very helpful in terms of um, its uh, use in, in creating rope and other agricultural purposes. But we do have evidence as early as 750 BCE for the use of cannabis for its psychoactive properties, uh, seemingly from a uh, shaman. There uh, is evidence that uh, cannabis was identified in early Chinese medicine and indeed in Roman medicine by Pliny the Elder and by the famous physician Galen, uh, probably most famous for his four humors, but uh, Galen also uh, identified the psychoactive properties of cannabis as being potentially beneficial for medical purposes. So really the, the application of cannabis in medical context has been around for literally millennia. More recently, uh, the Victorian era is when the interest in cannabis really uh, took off in part based on two different physicians, uh, William O'Shaughnessy and uh, Jacques Joseph Moreau. Uh, in the first case, uh, O'Shaughnessy was an Irish physician who traveled to India and was inspired by the folk applications of cannabis for a lot of different conditions, including managing fever, convulsions or seizures in children are inflammation and pain and began uh, initial uh, descriptions of uh, the use of cannabis for medical purposes and promoted its inclusion in the pharmacopoeia of the day. Uh, Jacques Joseph Moreau was a French physician who likewise, li likewise traveled east and uh, was inspired by folk applications of cannabis and also promoted the, the use of cannabis for medical purposes, although primarily in the context of uh, mental health applications. So in the Victorian era, there was considerable enthusiasm for cannabis as a medicine. And indeed, indeed, it was available in many of the over what would be considered now over the counter tonics and tinctures that would be used for medical purposes, much like opium or cocaine were. In terms of uh, the, the Canadian context, um, prior to 1925, uh, cannabis was legal and was, uh, as I alluded to, used in some cases for medical purposes, but it became 
technically illegal in 1925 with the passage of the Geneva International Convention on Narcotics Control. That wasn't because there was a significant concern about cannabis, but it was included as part of the ratification of that uh, treaty. And as a result, cannabis became illegal in Canada. That changed most dramatically in 2001 with the passage of the MMAR or the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations that made cannabis legal for medical purposes for a very small number of conditions with very uh, uh, high oversight. However, those uh, regulations were substantially liberalized with the MMPR and ACMPR, the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations and the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations, which really created the contemporary medical cannabis landscape in which uh, cannabis is available with a physician authorization, not a prescription, simply a, uh, a, uh, a note that permits access to the medical cannabis marketplace and cannabis is delivered in the medical marketplace by licensed producers who grow and sell those medical products. Obviously a huge change, maybe the, the largest change uh, uh, to date was the federal legalization of cannabis for non-medical purposes or essentially for recreational purposes. That took place nearly five years ago on October 17, 2018. Um, but as I like to emphasize, legalization is not an event. It is an unfolding set of changes that happen that may take uh, effect based on a piece of legislation, but ultimately become manifest via many different changes that follow. And so an example of that is that in 2019, a year later, that's when uh, legalization of non-dried flower products, products like edibles, drinkables became legal and storefronts began, began uh, becoming legal. So uh, really, uh, although October 17th, 2018 was the, the beginning of legalization in Canada, that process continues to unfold to this day, five years later. The other thing to be aware of across this timeline is how much changed in terms of medical cannabis use. So this shows the number of Health Canada medical cannabis authorizations from 2014 to the beginning of legalization uh, in 2018. So you can see that in 2014, there were only about 8,000 Canadians who had an authorization for medical cannabis, a comparatively small number. But with the passage of the new liberalized access laws, that number skyrocketed. And by 2018, that number was around 340,000, a more than 4,000% increase. So there's been a real skyrocketing in the number of people seeking medical authorizations. And what we also know from our studies is that the majority of people who report using cannabis for medical purposes do not report getting a healthcare provider's authorization. They do it informally, um, either now through uh, the legal provincial monopoly, for example, in Ontario, or prior to legalization via the uh, contraband system. So th these are almost certainly very, very large underestimates. But nonetheless, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people seeking a medical authorization for cannabis. And that's not really to do with a dramatic change in the evidence, as you'll hear in, in future talks at the conference. Um, it's not that the, the evidence has suddenly transformed and now there are clear indications for which many people would benefit. Really, what has changed is the policy and the access. And as a result, many more people had access and availed themselves of that access. Just to see that uh, up close, this is again uh, the, the, the steep increasing curve of medical cannabis authorizations. Many people thought that this would dramatically uh, drop following legalization. There's a slightly new system, so the data are slightly different now, but what you can see since legalization took effect was actually in the initial months, that hasn't changed very much. Now, uh, there was a dip during the COVID-19 lockdowns, you can see, here we have March 2020, and following that, there were uh, noticeably fewer authorizations, but there was also quite a substantial rebound. Uh, and although we'll be talking about data later in the meeting that use a, a longer time window, at least immediately following legalization, we did not see a dramatic decrease in the number of medical cannabis authorizations. So there remains uh, a, apparently a sizable number of Canadians uh, who are actively using cannabis for medical purposes. So when we talk about cannabis, who are we really talking about in terms of um, 
people and uh, population trends. So uh, this is, again, focusing on data that precede legalization, because we're going to focus on changes for many of the empirical talks at this meeting. But in terms of background, this is going back to Health Canada's data from prior to legalization. Uh, Canada was a comparatively high use country relative to peer high income Western nations. Um, about one in six people reported use of cannabis in the last year. That was a rate that was slightly lower than the US, but higher than the UK, for example, uh, New Zealand or Australia, other members of the Commonwealth and countries like Sweden and Germany. Um, so the, the overall population rates were relatively high. We know that those have been going up. And as I said, we'll talk more about that in future uh, sessions of this conference. In terms of who is actually using cannabis, if, if we look at the overall population here, we see again about one in six, about 15% report using cannabis in the past year. This is much lower than alcohol, uh, where about eight out of 10 people will report using any alcohol in the past year, much, much higher than stimulants, um, prescription drugs and hallucinogens. Um, the, the biggest uh, differences are by developmental age. You can see that um, young adults use a much higher rate compared to other population groups. So adults 25 and older uh, report around 13%, whereas about one in three, uh, either young adults or emerging adults, 20 to 24, 18 to 25, depending on the definition that you use, report using cannabis in the last year. And then uh, a noticeably higher rate uh, among adolescents, 15 to 19, where about one in five are using cannabis. The other uh, thing of, of great interest, of course, is the, the changes in cannabis use prior to legalization. So these are data, again, from the federal government looking at changes from 2013 to 2017. Uh, in red, you have the general population where we do see a, a gradual increase going from around one in 10 to around one in six. And that is common for adults in general, 25 to 64. What is noticeable is that the rates of Cannabis use in young people prior to legalization were noticeably going up from around 25% to around 33%. Um, the, the same uh, is especially true for older adults who, although use at the lowest absolute level, have shown the largest proportionate increases in terms of prior to legalization. Um, one piece of good news was that prior to legalization, it looks like youth use, that is 15 to 19, was generally trending down. Um, which is uh, certainly a favorable trend. And keep in mind that uh, the Cannabis Act uh, was in part designed to reduce youth access and via a regulated legal system, uh, uh, protect and prevent uh, young adults, uh, well, I should say young um, uh, use of cannabis in young people. The other big population trends that are worth noticing, this is this is early post uh, cannabis use. Um, we, we don't see dramatic changes early on. These are the very earliest phases of data from the Canadian Cannabis Survey. We do see a, a gradual escalation in the overall population and a, a blip around uh, youth 15 to 24 immediately following cannabis legalization that has been stabilized. We'll get more uh, data uh, in future sessions. Uh, and again, what we see is that, especially among older adults, uh, since legalization, there has been a, a gradual increasing trend. Um, and we'll, we'll dig more deeply into that also. There are big differences by sex. So one thing that we know is that males use considerably more than females. You can see that in general, there's a kind of step function difference between females and males in terms of overall use. And there appears to be also more noticeable increases in males over time with rates being uh, highest uh, uh, or and escalating most steeply among males and being more gradual among females. So there are substantial uh, overall uh, differences by sex and across different population groups by age. These were also the case uh, immediately following legalization where again, we see a much more noticeable increase in cannabis use among males and a much more uh, flat or um, uh, gradual gradient among uh, females. All right, last uh, section for this initial fundamentals talk is 
how do we think about that original question again of balancing benefits versus harms? And uh, most of the preceding slides are intended to be context. What are the products we're talking about? What is the history of those products? What are the 10,000 foot population trends in terms of the utilization of, of cannabis, uh, both for medical and recreational purposes? And so as we go forward, how do we judge the relative cost benefit ratio? And one of the approaches that we're going to use or that's going to come up later today, especially in the next talk, is the using uh, the use of a, an evidence based uh, framework for evaluating uh, the benefits of cannabis when it's applied to medical purposes and indeed the associated harms. This is the GRADE approach. GRADE stands for grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluations. And what the GRADE approach really tries to do, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is it tries to quantify the evidence in order to give clinicians and the public the best available evidence. And what do I mean by quantify? Well, that typically means conducting what are called meta-analyses in which findings across studies are harmonized together and converted into overall effect sizes that give us a sense for how helpful or harmful some, an intervention is. The GRADE system also uh, provides an evaluative quality judgment on the evidence. That is, is there a great deal of bias? Is there reason to be skeptical about certain findings? To what extent uh, should we trust the overall uh, quantity of the literature? And then the, the great approach also emphasizes how do we make sense of clinically important uh, or, or identify the clinically important effects. In other words, a, an intervention may be statistically significantly uh, beneficial, but does it necessarily result in a patient's important difference on its target outcomes? And two examples of statistics that are used in this evidence-based medicine framework for quantifying benefits and harms are the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. Uh, there's a typo I see that that should be uh, NNH. And what the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm do is fundamentally uh, convert the statistical uh, differences into the number of patients who would need to receive a, an intervention to get a clinically important benefit or to experience a clinically important harm. And by using these different techniques, meta-analysis, evaluation of the quality of the evidence, quantification of the evidence into metrics like number needed to treat, number needed to harm, the great approach tries to make recommendations for clinicians and um, more broadly for the field based on the balance of the evidence uh, and where the, the risk benefit profile comes from. So this is going to be one of the frameworks we're gonna use in terms of thinking critically about uh, the, the, the use of cannabis for medical purposes and in general, the, the risks and benefits from cannabis. All right, so I'll, I'll just recap some of the points from this first presentation. Um, what we know is that cannabinoids come in many forms. They're in our inherent innate biology. They can be affected by plant products. Those plant products have been adapted into different pharmaceutical medicines. Um, and indeed, uh, can be uh, those same, that same endocannabinoid system can be affected by um, uh, novel compounds that have no relationship to, to the plant, also in synthetic cannabinoids. We know that cannabis has a very long history of use in humans. It's been used for agricultural purposes. It's been used for its psychoactive effects. It's been used for medical purposes for uh, millennia. And uh, as a result, uh, this is this is not a lot of the, the current uses of cannabis are not you, new, but they represent the kind of uh, modernity's lens as applied to medical and recreational uses. We know that in Canada, the rates of cannabis use are comparatively high, really second over only to, to alcohol and uh, in some cases tobacco. Um, we also know that cannabis use is not uh, equal across the population. It tends to most commonly be present in young adults and in males. And then finally, uh, we know that we can use frameworks from evidence-based medicine to inform the risks and benefits from cannabis uh, and in turn make the best possible recommendations in terms of clinical practice 
and evidence-based policy. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm happy to take any questions people may have. Uh, and please do add your questions into the uh, Q&A box rather than the chat if you uh, have any questions. No questions coming through yet. I have a question about the synthetic cannabinoids. It's interesting to me that you talk about the synthetic cannabinoids only having uh, potential harms right now. Do you think that there might be potential for any benefits coming from synthetic cannabinoids? The original genesis of the program of research that led to those synthetic cannabinoids was in the interest or the in the hope of identifying uh, novel uh, compounds that could be used um, either for benefit in general or uh, potentially, for example, as treatments for cannabis use disorder. So certainly there's potential there. I think, unfortunately, what we're finding uh, is that um, more often than not, they have been appropriated by the contraband uh, side of the side of things for uh, recreational purposes. Um, but I think that, uh, or, or at least putative uh, recreational purposes, but the reality is the short answer is probably yes, that, that if we can find ways of favorably affecting the endocannabinoid system, I certainly think that uh, uh, there could be therapeutic applications. All right, a couple of questions have come in from Tom Bell. Uh, to what degree has historic legislation, for example, Harry Ainslinger of the US Narcotic Bureau in the time of FDR for one, impeded proper research into cannabis? I think to a very large degree. I think that many have written and discussed the politicization of cannabis, especially in the US. And I think that um, in the US, the scheduling of cannabis is a schedule one drug that is a drug that has only the highest level of abuse liability and no medical applications is a good example of how there there continue to be reverberations of those kinds of um, uh, policies and perspectives. I think fundamentally um, the the not unlike psychedelics, the very stringent uh, regulation or, or attempted control over cannabis definitely had a chilling effect on research on medical applications and, and perhaps more even-handed perspectives on legalization of cannabis, which is in part why uh, in the U.S. legalization initiatives have almost uh, have entirely come from the states rather than at the federal level. Question from Marilyn White Campbell. Given the pharmacodynamic and pharma pharmacokinetic differences, can you speak to the need to have different doses of cannabis for older adults versus young versus pediatrics? Yeah, I think that's a, a really big um, gap in the, the, the field because the, the reality is we know that, you know, all uh, drugs do have, um, you know, Virtually all drugs are evaluated in terms of differences in metabolism across the lifespan. And the there is relatively little work on understanding, for example, the comparative differences in metabolism or absorption or distribution of cannabis products in seniors or in individuals who have liver compromise or other medical conditions. Certainly in pediatric populations, uh, in most cases, there has been relatively little study in terms of systematic differences. So I think unfortunately that's where we see there are many more questions than answers because we know that there are big differences in effects, but we don't necessarily know how dosing should be changed in pediatric or seniors populations. Two questions about youth that I'll combine. Uh, what do you think is an explanation for the decrease among youth for cannabis use? And the second question, is there any data that show why or for what purpose cannabis is mostly used in youth? So uh, the 
to the first part of well, to the first question, I think that we really don't know what's responsible for that. And I think that it, it is too early to say also that that is a sustained reduced uh, uh, level of use or that that, it, that trajectory is continued. But certainly over the course of legalization, it doesn't appear that there have been dramatic increases. One possibility is that there has been some successful public health messaging, although I would argue that certainly more would be beneficial. Um, I, I think that it is possible that um, in a regulated environment, it may be that there's, there is lower access, although again, that's an empirical question too. So I think that really it's, it's not well understood why there have been those decreases, although there has been a lot of media attention to legalization and along with that, some of the, the uh, harms and risks of cannabis, which, which may have had a positive public education um, component. In terms of the, the question of um, uh, why young people use, what, what we know is that there are diverse reasons for motives in general and in young people, and it can be broadly defined as falling into five categories, use for enhancement, feeling good, coping, relieving, feeling bad, social purposes, peer uh, purposes and uh, sensory enhancement. And what we do see in youth is that in general, uh, young people do in, in, endorse more of the social and uh, peer pressure related motives and less of the kind of narrow rewarding and relieving motives. Um, and, and that's very similar to alcohol uh, in terms of a lot of youth use taking place in or being highly environmentally mediated and socially mediated as a, a form of uh, social uh, experience. A few more questions uh, from Ruth Ross. I'm interested in the increase in medical use without increasing quality of good evidence. Can you unpack this a bit more? Is this related to perhaps to changing perceptions of cannabis benefits or perhaps marketing? Yeah, I think it's a, a bit of both. I think that um, this to me is a, a bit of a perfect storm of increasing access and uh, increasing uh, information that is de facto marketing. I think if you Google cannabis for uh, virtually any condition, you will find Dr. Google will tell you that it is supported and most of the information that you'll get is not evidence-based. And that reality in combination with very high access via often, for example, tele telemedicine consults uh, to, to get cannabis authorizations and the convenience of getting cannabis uh, delivered to your house from a licensed producer really promoted a, um, a, a lot of that extremely steep upticks, up, uptick in, in use. So I really do believe that it's a combination of access and what is sometimes direct marketing, sometimes sort of informal marketing. I also think that in some cases, uh, there are reimbursement programs that promote, effectively promote cannabis. Um, the most uh, well-known of these is that uh, for Canadian veterans, the uh, up to 10 grams of cannabis daily can be reimbursed if there's an approved condition. And as a result, it means that, again, there's there's one more form of access that is promoted um, and, and may be part of that steep increase. So I wish I, it was to do with better evidence, but I think that the reality is it has a lot more to do with access and marketing, um, often in kind of covert ways via the Internet. Next question, with legalization of cannabis, is there a marked increase in the number of uh, ED visits for cannabis toxicity? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I don't want to spoil uh, one of our speakers who is uh, arguably our uh, the, the most prolific researcher on this topic in Canada, uh, Daniel Myron. So, Suffice it to say, I think that there is some evidence of uh, troubling upticks in the emergency department. I think he'll present more uh, detailed data on that, but I think that that is one of the locations where there are some uh, some some uh, troubling early signs of uh, or red flags uh, post legalization. 
from Darby Whitaker. What evidence exists to explain the differences in cannabis consumption between males and females? It's a great question. So what we know is that there are inherent differences between males and females in terms of the endocannabinoid system. And so the, the, the biology of the endocannabinoid system may partially be responsible for that. My personal opinion is that that's, that's only a piece of the puzzle and probably not the, the largest piece. We know for other substance use, uh, rates tend to be higher in males and in general in psychiatry, what we see is there's a much higher rate of what we call externalizing disorders or conditions that involve acting out conditions like substance use disorders or um, uh, ADHD in males relative to internalizing uh, disorders or uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and other conditions like that in females. So I think some of that has to do perhaps with biology. Some of it has to do with um, social mores, probably. And uh, I think that the, the exact reasons are, are not well known, but it generally mirrors the same patterns of, of trends in terms of alcohol and other substance use also. From Ryan McNeil, how much is known about the entourage effect? So I think, unfortunately, um, there's, a, there's a lot less known about it than, than is speculated about. And, and part of that is because it's a very hard thing to study because the entourage effect could be at, is, is a very nebulous idea, right? It's the idea that um, there may be that the whole of the effect is greater than the sum of its parts in the sense that consuming a variety of different cannabinoids uh, then somehow stimulates the endocannabinoid system in a qualitatively different, more favorable way. The problem with that is it requires then identifying what those various constituents are and doing experimental studies that systematically dismantle whether or not there are meaningful interactions. Probably the closest we've come to uh, looking at this is in the area of, for example, in the Bixamols, where you have two cannabinoids that are being uh, administered simultaneously. But the reality is, in my mind, the entourage effect remains much more of a hypothesis than an area, than a, a, an evidence-based reality, in part because just with every additional compound, you, you introduce a lot more experimental burden in terms of really understanding what the, uh, if, if there is a, a synergistic effect or uh, reduction. A comment from an attendee, uh, endocannabinoids and phytocannabinoids work on other receptors beyond CB1 and CB2, adding to the complex pharmacology and clinical effects, making it almost impossible to study. The, amen. Uh, I think that the reality is my, my very brief primer on the endocannabinoid system did leave out TRPV and did leave out other um, receptor targets. The, the reality is that um, the endocannabinoid system is exceptionally complex. And I think that um, there are lots of things we don't know about it. One of the things that I'll talk about this afternoon is um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And uh, a, a complete mystery there is why in some ways cannabis seems to have anti-emetic, anti-nausea effects, and also seems to, uh, following high doses chronically lead to chronic um, vomiting. So, uh, and that, that is in part speculated to be uh, as a result perhaps of uh, adaptations to um, other receptor subtypes like um, the, uh, for example, TRPV. So I think unfortunately, um, the, the uh, attendee is absolutely right that, that there is even greater complexity than just CB1 and CB2. I'm aware that we're over time for the session. Do you want to continue answering live or do you want to type answers in to the chat? I think we are going to have to wrap up. Um, let's, uh, I, I will uh, type answers back into the, the chat, um, but I am mindful of time. Our next talk will be starting at 11 a.m. and will be uh, Dr. Jason Bussa, the Associate Director of the DeGroote Center, who will be presenting on uh, the state of the evidence for medical cannabis. Um, I appreciate all the, the excellent questions and participation in this session. I will um, offline uh, 
uh, type in answers to the existing questions. Thank you everybody for participating in this session.